Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to a pre-recorded episode of Jerry's Live. Now, emphasis on the pre-recorded part of that, because I'm not here. I'm actually off at a residency in France. So I, uh, unfortunately, was not able to actually make it live, but we are going to make sure that our moderators and everybody in the team, as well as myself, we're going to be answering those questions for you guys. So please feel free to pop any of your comments and you know, responses and questions in the chat below, and we will make sure to get back to you. So let's jump over to the episode. Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I'm your host this evening. And today, I wanted to do something that's a little bit more fun and kind of experimental. And you don't have to exactly copy what I do. It's going to be very hard for you to do that because you're going to need your own reference and things. But I, I wanted you guys to see this as more of a jumping off point to kind of inspire you to do uh, various experiments with light and shadow and kind of playing with your artwork. So today we are going to be doing shadow painting. This is something that has been done uh, by several artists and I've seen this uh, just as like a quick little experiment to you know freshen your skills and, and just kind of renew what you're doing in your art studio. Uh, Andy Warhol has also done this in his shadow paintings, although his were photographs and screen printings and very abstract and very up close and very different from what I'm going to be doing today, which is why I wanted to show you this process. So in order to do this, you're going to need a surface, which is appropriate for the media you use because you can do this with any media, any at all. Um, you also are going to need an object to put in front of your canvas. I'm going to be using flowers today because, you know, it's almost springtime here today. You know, we're, we're, it's, I'm ready for the flowers. Plus, they're really fun to, to draw, and there's a lot of really fun shapes that you can get with the different types of flowers. So you're going to need an object, but you don't have to use flowers. You can even use dinosaurs or your hand if you want to. Uh, and then you're going to need a light source. Uh, now, besides that, you are also going to need a pencil and then your actual paint. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is try to figure out the shadow that you want to place on your canvas. Now, you can experiment with that with the light source being closer to your canvas or further away, or having your flower or whatever your object is be further away and closer as well. You can play with that. Now, the one thing that I've learned from doing this is that if you have a small flower that's very relatively simple, one leaf or something like that, you can hold it up to your canvas and kind of get that shape relatively quickly without having to worry too much about the details because that's what, not what we're here for. Um, but if you have a really intricate flower or a bunch of flowers that has all types of shapes and you want to do that up against your canvas, the one thing I have found is that you want something to hold this. <laughs> Just because it gets very daunting to your non-dominant hand to hold that while you're trying to trace and then to, to move around and try and get those shapes is a little bit more difficult. So if you are doing something a little bit more intricate, make sure to have it stable. Um, my favorite is to put it in a vase with a piece of tape up against it so it stays put and then I can rotate the vase around and be able to move the shadow however which way I want to. Um, then you can also experiment with the different types of flowers. If you want a bunch of flowers or if you just want a single flower, you know, you have a lot of options. Now, the other thing I have noted or have realized uh, while doing this process is that you want a single light source. Now, we're in the studio. I have lights all around me so you guys can see my face and what I'm doing. Um, but when it comes to if, at home, if you have a really sunshine, like a really sunny window, or if you have um, a table lamp, or even your overhead lamp in your uh, your house, uh, the one thing that I will not recommend is LEDs, just because usually they're a grouping of LEDs, and that gives you, technically speaking, like 30 different light bulbs, and that will cast really funny shadows on your artwork. So you can you can experiment around and then play with that. So. The other thing I have noticed, just so you guys do understand just the little kinks, especially when you're working with flowers, is that smaller flowers, like this is the, the really intricate stuff that I was talking about. Smaller flowers are really fun, but it's really hard to get those really definitive shapes just because there's a lot going on and they're really hard to kind of really get a, a solid shadow just because 
the light can kind of pass around them unless you get really close to your canvas. Also, if you start using quite a lot, this is not something I would recommend. This I have a lot of patience and I love intricate, very detailed work like this, but even I don't have the patience for something like this. This is a lot. <laughs> so try to make sure you go for larger shapes, uh, especially if you're just trying to experiment and play with this. So let's get painting. I, I'm gonna go grab my really big yellow flower. Like I said, in a vase with a piece of tape so it's nice and stable. And I actually have it sitting on my, my easel, um, or my, my easel stool, what's the easel stool? Yeah. And then I have it just sitting on that and then that way it's nice and stable. I can turn it any which way I want and I can position it on the canvas, right? And now what I'm gonna do is pop right over here because I'm, I'm not blocking the shadow now, which is kind of the most important thing. But now that I have it nice and stable, I can actually move over to the side and I can see all those different shadow shapes. So I'm going to, uh, let's do something like this. I like that. I like that little floopy leaf that's kind of, it's, it's a sad leaf, but we can, we can include it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually draw just the very basic shapes. You can get as intricate as you want, but I'm gonna try and keep it relatively simple. Great, flower. And then, because this part of the flower is lit up and that part of the petals are actually blocking all of that, I can't see anything but the stem, so it's nice and easy. But I'm gonna also pop in those leafy shapes. And if it's not 100% perfect, that's okay. This is just to play around with and have fun, you know? You can draw your leaves as separate shapes, like I'm doing here, and kind of attach them that way. Or you can also just group that together as one big shadow chunk. You don't have to draw those little, like the inner details, depending on how you paint it. This is far more loosey-goosey for me than any of my other artwork. Because normally I'm very detailed and intricate and this is a fun way like that I use to uh, really loosen up. And down here, I'm just going to try not to block the shadow too much. And let's get this little floopy leaf. Bleep. And then the rest of the stem, and voila, I have my shadow shapes. Now, whoop, now comes the fun part. I get to paint that. <laughs> now I can, if I really wanted to, I can paint this as detailed and as realistic as I wanted to, or I can go a little bit more abstracty. And like I said, you can use this for any media. So watercolor, this is just on watercolor paper. Um, and as you can see, I did not pay attention to the color of the flowers. It was honestly these. You can draw inspiration from them. But I didn't exactly paint what it was. I actually just started in one spot and went down with washes and just popped in colors and I thought it was really fun. Now the other cool thing that has me thinking of this is that I now kind of want to go over top of it with masking fluid and do another big wash in the background, maybe get a little bit more abstract, I don't know. But it's, maybe I'll have them in space, I don't know. It's a lot of experimentation. <laughs> Katie's laughing at me now. <laughs> the other thing that you can do is also use oils. So uh, this is just the Arches oil paper um, that I used and I have a little 
a little thing so I can make sure I can hold it here, uh, taped to the back. But this is this flower, and I didn't paint it exactly, but I just wanted to make sure that I could draw inspiration from it. And this is a little bit more photorealistic, but it is in oils, so you can use this process for any media, which is really fun. Me, I'm going to paint this in acrylics. I'm going to be using the Lucas Krill Studio, and I'm going to probably get a little bit messy and fun with it because why not? It's, it's just kind of fun. So let's get to painting. That's valid. Um, this is the Lemon Yellow Primary. Lavender, because that's a really fun color with all those yellows. And alizarin crimson, which is really hard to open. Come on, squeeze the bottle. There we go. And you know what? We got to have some phthalo. Right, yeah, Viridian Thalo. I'd, I'd go there. But I am also going to be using the Liquitex glazing medium, just a little bit, for this initial kind of glaze layer. Because I don't want the opacity of this lavender, I want the color. Ooh, that's so pretty. So the glazing medium will give me that transparency to where I can keep seeing that line underneath, but I'm going to get real messy. What's going on with me lately? I've been real messy with my artwork. That's very unlike me. All right, so I'm going to be using the, a variety of the Ebony Splendor brushes. Um, they are a golden tacklon brush, which is really great for acrylics and well, it's kind of like a catch-all. It's really, really a nice, useful, versatile brush for quite a few media. Um, but I have in my hand, I'm going to tone the whole thing with the 5 eighths, uh, 5 eighths mop. Yeah, 5 eighths mop. Uh, that way I have a larger brush just to cover the whole area because I don't want to sit here and try and cover this with a tiny little brush. Then I grabbed a couple other ones. I have a 12 round, a half inch flat wash, the quarter inch angular, and then a number four round. So I can do little details if I need to. But I might not use all of those brushes, but they are here. We got a, a good variety of shapes to them if I di want different brush marks. Because remember, different brush shapes give you different brush marks. And that is, just think of it like tools in your toolbox. You don't use a hammer for everything, um, unless you're a cape man, I guess. You know, maybe you do smash everything with a hammer. Hulk. Hulk smash. But for me, I like to have a couple different types of brushes just so I can have a variety of those brush marks. It's just easier to get something to do what it's designed to do rather than struggle with a brush that is inappropriate for the brush mark I'm looking for. So I was going to kind of keep the edges a little messy, but I think I'm going to cover it all. Because if I have that messy lavender kind of shining through at the end, that would make me happy. All right. So there's my lavender. And the other cool, really cool thing, if you wanted to, you could actually take this when you're doing your initial outline, do the whole outline, take your panel, shift it over like maybe 
a quarter of an inch, just, just ever so slightly. And then anywhere where the shadow is kind of just shifted over just slightly, you can do that again. And then you can also have that as your shadow of your flower to where it looks like it's kind of popping off the canvas a little bit, which is really fun. So I have my lavender. Let me get this off my brush. And I think I'm going to go in once that's mostly dry, which it dries relatively quick. That uh, Liquitex glazing medium is not a drying retarder, so it actually will dry relatively fast, just like a normal acrylic would. All right, let's go in with, let's go in with the round. I like the round. This is a nice brush shape. I'm going to try and do the, uh, I think the flower first, right? Because then when I have the whole canvas toned, I think I'm going to actually go in and pop in some colors and have some fun with this. It really is. It's, it's like it's Jerry's life. All right, so I'm going to go in and paint the whole thing yellow. I'm going to do this messy, but I'm going to also do it semi-realistic, I guess. I'm going to use the appropriate colors. How about that? Yellow flower gets yellow paint. Specifically because that purple and that yellow, ooh. And the reason why that happens is because they are opposites of each other on the color wheel. So when you have the, uh, the opposites like that, the complementary colors, they just vibrate, which is so pretty. Now, if I wanted to kind of minimize that pencil mark that I initially had, you can go in, I would suggest with a kneaded eraser if you really want to. Um, when it comes to acrylics or oils, I really don't erase out that pencil mark just because I can cover it relatively easy with a like an opaque paint. Um, when it comes to watercolors though, if you really don't want that pencil mark, get a kneaded eraser and kind of pick up your graphite just a little bit so it's more of like a ghost of your original drawing. But when it comes to the acrylics, like you can see that lavender initial layer, even though it was very thin, and very much of a glaze, it knocked it back quite a lot. So same thing with oils. You really don't have to worry too much about the pencil marks. So I'm going to take this Indian yellow, kind of scrub it in here. I have a process, don't worry. I know it just looks like I made a big yellow orange blob on top of my flower and what am I doing? I have an idea. So I'm gonna let that dry and then I'm gonna go in over that with layers of the lighter colors and then that's gonna look like the shadows that are well, as those petals kind of go deep into the flower, they get that more orangey kind of tone. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna, even going to pop in a little alizarin crimson just to give it a little bit more of that depth color. Oof. And then the Indian yellow and that alizarin crimson make such a pretty color. It's like a really lovely orangey, orangey red. <laughs> So, I'm going to let that dry, and then I'm going to go in with layers. Let's get some of that phthalo and that yellow. Make a ridiculous, look at this green, oh my goodness. This is, this is green, this is way too green, but I'm going to do it anyway. Now. What I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to, because 
if you guys know me, I, I love a flat or a, a filbert brush. And whenever I pull my paint, I drag it along the, the big flat side to where I keep that really sharp point uh, on my brush. And then I have that nice big flat area. So I'm going to turn it sideways and I'm going to get that point of the leaf and then I'm going to rotate my brush and try to get that kind of leaf shape in one-ish go. I'm going to try and do this with as few brush strokes as possible. Which didn't get it quite. A little bit more paint here. Oh, that's green. Woo! Super green. <laughs>to start holding my brush at the end. There we go. We're going to tone down this crazy green with some alizarin crimson and a little bit more of that phthalo. another kind of muddy green because it's greens in real life are not like perfectly green they're muddy they're dirty looking and this kind of reminds me of like an orange when you take orangey like an orangey color and mix it in with green it reminds me of like a an orange that hasn't quite ripened all the way <laughs>
So, I love the lavender, but I think I need to darken the background just a little bit. But I don't have a darker purple. But, fear not, I have that phthalo viridian and alizarin crimson. And if you put more alizarin crimson in than the phthalo, you get a purple. And it's so pretty. So if I mix that lavender in with that, look at that variation in purple. It's so, so pretty. But I think I'm going to carve around this flower and kind of fix those shapes that I just blobbed all over my <laughs> all over my canvas. And I do need to come back in with a lighter value of the purple. I can still go in with the lavender because I'm not 100% sure on darkening it just yet, but I do need to fix this. Well, maybe I'll end up with a pure white. That's always fun too. Actually, I gotta say, anytime I have a really, really awesome background that I absolutely love, it's because I've painted over it like seven times. And you can see little bits of that original color and then the next layer and then the next layer. And that's what really makes like a really, really fun background. Struggle. Struggle makes a really fun background. to keep the background very messy like that on the edges. Personal aesthetic, you don't have to do it. I think it gives a little bit more visual interest, makes it read more as a painting. Like, I think originally I had just done like a straight line at the top of that. If I wanted to add a little bit more petal, you know, details, this is the stage you can do that. Probably would have looked really cool. And I'd done this and then offset it and then rotated it and did it like a couple more times and had it overlapping. That would have been fun. Next time. This is where this entire process can just continue to grow. You can continue to experiment and come up with new ideas of incorporating this into your art and making the process of creating art a little bit more fun and fresh. Because sometimes it can get stagnant, you know?
this is also why I love mixing my actual colors for the background. Like, I'm not trying, solid. yeah, I'm not trying to get one solid color, because that's, boring. it's boring, you know? And if I'm mixing a purple, I can get the variations where it's more red, where it's more of that phthalo, and then like darker down here, lighter up here. Like, it just makes me, like, it's visually lovely. Love it.
That was my sort of painterly kind of experimenting with the painting this flower. I mean, it's just, I try to get more loose and messy with it. And this is just me kind of pushing my own artistic abilities and not having to worry about rendering the flowers so perfectly. But then again, you can do something really experimental and fun and enjoy your colors and just let it kind of flow into those shapes. And, and really play around with it. Overlap the shapes, get it really big, get it really small. Just mess around and have fun with the, the experimentation. So if you do get a chance to actually experiment with this process, please make sure to post it to our Jerry's Live Facebook group. I would love to see what you make. And you can also tag me in it, which is Emmy, host of Jerry's Live. And you know, even if you don't wanna post it live for everyone to see, you can also send it dir directly to me as a you know, message. But I would love to see what you guys create out there. And I hope you enjoyed this process. So have fun and I will see you later.